Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another exciting Authors at Google Talk. Um, today we're featuring Dr. Michael Korist, who is an international authority on the intersections between sociology and medical technology, especially in the, in the field of cochlear implants. Um, he's spoken on the subject almost everywhere, from the pages of The Economist to the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco and even on NPR. Um, he received his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin and currently resides in San Francisco. Um, most recently, he's written a TV documentary on medical implants for PBS and is the co-editor of a book on education um, technology learning design, which also features one of our fellow Googlers, um, Chris DiGiano. He'll be speaking today about his, most, about his book, which is entitled Rebuilt my journey back to the hearing world. Um, he speaks about how becoming a, a cyborg changed his life and restored his hearing. Um, at the end of the talk, we'll have time for some questions and answers. We have a, a Q&A mic available for our virtual um, and remote offices. And as well, at the end of the talk, um, Mike, Dr. Korst will be available to sign books and answer any other remaining questions you have. So I'd like, to, like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Korst. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Important questions. I'm deaf, so I have to check if other people can hear me okay. Now, I'm going to talk today about my informative body and yours. So I'm going to start by talking about my informative body, and I'll talk about what informating means. But first, this is the book that I wrote about having an informative body. In an informated body is one that needs data to function or outputs data as an integral part of its functioning. Now, most bodies are not informated, okay? But mine is. If you take a close look at the, at the picture of my book cover here, and by the way, I think I may be the only author in publishing history to have a picture of the inside of his head and the outside of his head on the same book cover, okay? Because you can see here the inside of my skull, but also my face, because a CAT scan captures soft tissue as well as bone. So I have a pretty normal skull, except for the fact that you see this implant inside it right above where my ear is. The reason I have that is because I was first born with severe hearing losses back in 1964. My mother had rubella. There's an epidemic of rubella going on at that time. And so, as I like to say, I was in the right place at the wrong time. So I was born with severe hearing losses in both ears. I got hearing aids when I was about three and a half. And I did very well with hearing aids. And I thought nothing would ever change. But then in July 2001, I suddenly lost the remaining hearing in my good ear. So I went from being hearing impaired to being totally deaf in about four hours. On the trip home, I had two thoughts. The first thought was cochlear implant. And I'll talk about what a cochlear implant is. The second thought was, I could probably write a pretty good book about this. And that's exactly what I proceeded to do. I came home that evening, sat down, and started writing. Because I knew that I was going to be in for an astounding experience. The experience of having one of my senses transformed by computational power. So I want to try to convey to you not just what that is like, but also to talk about what that technology may do in the future. So as I've said, an informative body is one that needs data to work, where works output data as an, integ as an integral part of that functioning. Now that word informative is from a wonderful book by someone named Shoshana Zuboff. This book came out in 1988. And she introduced this word to talk about how industries are transformed when computing comes into them. For example, paper mills were transformed because people went from smelling and feeling pulp to using dials and sensors to measure it. So they went from handling with their hands to being information workers in white rooms reading dials in just a few years. So the whole paper mill industry was informated when computer technology came in. And really, the rest of the planet has been informated in so many ways. But one thing that has not been informated is the human body, except in a few exceptions, like in my case. So one thing that I want to talk about today is the business of informated bodies, because Google is, of course, a business. 
It's much more than a business, but one thing it is, is a business. So a suggestion that I'm going to be making is that informing the body is going to create entirely new industries to provide devices and services. Medical monitoring and control, mind control of external devices, and I'm going to show you some eye-popping medias demonstrating just that, and communication between people. So my second book, which I just sold last week, so I'm over the moon about this, is about these prospects. It's about informing the body. So like any artist, I love to talk about stuff I've done, but I love even more to talk about the stuff that I am doing. So this is the book that I'm writing now. I just sold it to the Free Press, which is owned by Simon & Schuster. So it should come out in 2010, maybe 2011. So a lot of the ideas I'm going to be presenting in this talk are ideas that are going to be going into this book. So I want to give you an example, a sort of a down-home example of informating the body. You know, I wrote a story on a company called Proteus Biomedical. They're local. They're a Bay Area company. They've created a really interesting technology called the Raisin System. They're creating it. It's not on the market yet. It's, it's in development. And I wrote an article in Technology Review on their technology. And here's the way it works. The user swallows a pill. Now, this pill has a microchip on its surface. And there's a battery on the pill as well. So when you swallow the pill, the battery is activated by the water in your stomach. The pill emits electrical signals that identify what the pill is. The user wears a center patch on their body that picks up that signal and records what pill was swallowed and when it was swallowed. Not only that, the center also records the body's response to the pill, changes in temperature, changes in blood pressure, changes in the user's activity. And this is done with technology that's a bit like MEMS technology, with miniature accelerometers, for example. And then the sensor sends that data to the patient's cell phone, which then sends it on to the physician's server. So the doctor can take a look at a record of exactly what medications the patients took and when, and look at their effect on the body. So you can see that this hypothetical patient here is outputting a stream of data that signifies their body's response to medication. So in a very profound way, that patient's body has become a site of data production. That's an example of what I mean by informating the body. So I think this concept of informating, especially where the body is concerned, is going to become more and more important as time goes on. And I think Google is going to play a big role in that informating. Just for example, I have found that I cannot work without Google anymore. I have to do Google searches six or eight times an hour just to do my work. When I don't have Google, my brain just comes to a stop. When I was younger, I was able to defer certain questions. What is that book? What is that reference? I was able to put XXX on the manuscript and keep writing and come back and answer those questions later. I can't do that anymore. I have to go get the answer immediately. It's built into my writing flow. And not only that, it's not just concrete answers to specific questions. It's ideas and articles. I will stop, Google a certain term, learn about it, read about it, go back to writing. So the information economy and technology has become central to the way I think. And I suspect that is the same for many, many other people as well. So collectively, technologies like Google, the web, Wikipedia, and various other services are in effect informating human consciousness that we are becoming integrated into a global network of data consumption and data production. So here's another example of that kind of integration. Um, so, you know, like right now I have a, I have a Blackberry because I'm waiting to get an iPhone G3. But I've borrowed, uh, you know, my girlfriend's iPhone, you know, on fairly frequent occasions. So, and I've done it to ask questions like, and I've done this with, with my Blackberry too, by the way. Questions like, how high is this hill I'm climbing? Like when I was climbing Twin Peaks in San Francisco, I just wanted to have a sense, how much am I going up today? What do the critics say about this particular movie, like outside the theater? Where can I find 10 stakes on Market Street? That was just before Burning Man, where I really, really needed 10 stakes. Where are Scientific American's offices? So these are all questions that I was asking, not when I was sitting down at a computer in the office, but out in the world, in the street, living my life. And so it's become so integral to the way I live to have access to that kind of data 
that when my BlackBerry died, I um, had a fatal Java machine error, which actually killed the BlackBerry, don't ask me how, I felt bereft for the 24 hours it took me to get a new BlackBerry. Because not only did I lack access to my email, but I was also lacking access to the planetary global memory, which to me has become very important. So this is an example of a kind of integration of the body and the, and the information technology. Of course, such inter integration only goes so far. I dropped this, it stopped being integrated with my body. Now, I'm going to bring up a slide, which is about a, a, a much deeper kind of integration. And I'm aware that I'm doing this just after lunch, okay? So be prepared to see some red here, okay? Now, this is a deeper level of human computer integration. What you're looking at is a cochlear implant, and I'll talk more about what it is in a moment. But this is the cochlear implant just after the surgery has been completed and before the skin has been stitched over the flap to close it up again. Now, this is inside the patient's skull. I have one of these inside my skull. And so as you can see, the device is countersunk into the bone. The surgeon drills out a hollow about the size of the implant, countersinks it into place, then ties down metal sutures to hold it in place, then drills a tunnel through bone to the inner ear. And this lead that you see goes to a set of 16 electrodes that are curled up inside the inner ear. Those electrodes trigger the auditory nerves in the inner ear and create the sensation of hearing. Now, the reason I have to have a cochlear implant, oh, by the way, this is the actual internal chip itself, okay? So when I say informating, I mean it, okay? This is hardware, but it's also software, and I'll be talking more about software. So if you opened up the casing, that is the electronics that you would see. By the way, this is the model that I got in my left ear in 2001. About six months ago, I got an upgraded model in my right ear, which is the same electronics but a different casing, but a different package. So this is cochlear implant 101. So I want to walk you through all the pieces so that you understand how a cochlear implant works. Let's do this from the inside out, okay? I want to just skip ahead briefly to the next slide and just talk about why I'm deaf. This is an electron micrograph of hair cells in the inner ear. The inner ear is a spiral-shaped organ shaped like a snail shell. It's called the cochlea. The word cochlea is Latin for snail. The cochlea actually looks like a snail. And if you opened it up and unrolled it and got a microscope and looked inside, you'd see these tiny little bundles of hair cells. Each of these is a single cell, okay? So you would not see this with a naked eye. When sound waves sweep through the cochlea, they make these things vibrate. Each of these things is connected to a set of nerve endings, and those nerves send information to the brain. So this system translates sound vibrations into electrical impulses. So this is a biological transducer. In a healthy cochlea, the hair cells look like this. In a cochlea that has been affected by viruses or disease or any, any of a number of factors, the hair cells look like this. In other words, they have been physically separated from the body of the cell. They are unable to transfer wave motion to the cell body. Now, the nerves remain intact. What's gone is the mechanical structures that pick up the vibrations. That's why I'm deaf. So to come back here, this is the cochlea. So if you open that up, you'd see it lined with about three and a half thousand of those tiny little bundles of hairs. So in my case, the nerve going to the brain is perfectly intact. There's nothing wrong with it. What's missing, of course, is the structures that transfer wave motion to it. So a cochlear implant works in the following way. Now I'm going to take you from the outside in. We're going to start with this device. This is the processor. Now, my processor is a later version. This is the processor that I got back in 2001. This is the processor that I wear now on this ear. So it looks like a hearing aid, but it's not a hearing aid. The device, now, I don't know if the video can get close enough. If you can zoom in on this to get a good look at it, that would be great. So the device has a microphone here. That's what picks up sound. The middle body here is the processor itself that digitizes the sound into a string of ones and zeros. This is a rechargeable lithium ion battery, provides the system with power. And this is a radio transmitter, this round disc. This sends data through the skin to the implant. 
It also has a magnet inside it so that the headpiece sticks to the skull. There is no, there is no direct connection. It's a radio link through the skin, through intact skin. So there's nothing penetrating the skin. So the processor, which you've just seen, goes to a headpiece, which sticks against the skin, held in place by a magnet, sends radio data through the skin to the implant. The implant picks up the signal with an antenna, uses that signal to generate power and to pick up the data, sends the signal down the electrode array into, into the cochlea. And this is a close-up inside the cochlea. You can see here the electrode array goes inside the cochlea and that there are 16 tiny electrodes on the inner surface that face toward the auditory nerves in the center of the cochlea. Those electrodes flash on and off in rapid sequence and make the auditory nerves fire signals to the brain. Now, I'll be talking a bit about how the software is written that decides which electrodes to fire when, but that's the essence of how a cochlear implant works. So what it is doing it is bypassing the broken mechanical structures of my brain and triggering the nerves in my inner ear directly. It is replacing the mechanical structures with computational code. Any questions at this point about the mechanics of the system? Okay, let's go on. There will be time for questions afterward. Now, I want to try to give you some sense of what the world sounds like to a cochlear implant user. So this is a simulation written by Arthur Boothroy, um, based on the work of Robert Chan. These are specialists in auditory science. So what I'm going to play for you is an English sentence that has been filtered electronically to resemble different generations of cochlear implants. I'm going to start with a one-channel implant. And roughly speaking, a one-channel implant is a one-electrode implant, an implant with a single electrode inside the cochlea. Not 16 electrodes, but just one electrode. So it's taking all the data and putting it into a single spot inside the cochlea. These kind of implants were trialed back in the 70s and the early 80s. So I'll play this, this will give you some inkling of what those people heard. Let's see. Okay, anybody understand that? Okay, two electrodes. Anybody? Okay, let's go up to four electrodes. I'll do it again. Anybody? Now let's go to eight electrodes. Now, when I was first activated, when I first got my first implant in my left ear, my software gave me eight channels of auditory information. The electrode array had 16 electrodes, but the software at that time paired each, they, they put the two electrodes in pairs, taking 16 electrodes and giving you eight channels of auditory information. So here's eight channels. I like to play tennis. Okay, how many people feel like they mostly understand it? Okay, so it's at eight channels that people start to get it. By the way, there's fundamental research showing that you need a minimum of six channels to understand speech. By comparison, a normal ear gives the user about 3,500 channels of auditory information. So a couple lessons. First, you can give people an extraordinarily degraded signal and still retain some intelligibility. Listen again. I like to play tennis. Okay. It's not great fidelity, but it's somewhat understandable. About a year later, I upgraded to 16 channels. This was purely a software upgrade. There was no change to the electrodes themselves. Instead, I just took each electrode and gave each electrode a single and individual channel. So here's 16 channels. I like to play tennis. Okay, that sound clear? Okay, now, right now I am running 16 channels in both ears. I'll talk a little bit about, about ways to get more channels. But right now, I'm running 16 channels in both ears. To give you some idea of the difference between what you hear and what I hear, I'm now going to play the original unaltered sound file. I like to play tennis. So that allows you to hear the difference between what I hear and what you hear. Now, there's an interesting 
philosophical conundrum which you Googlers might enjoy thinking about. What does a simulation of a cochlear implant sound like to a cochlear implant user? Okay. I don't think even Plato could have solved that conundrum. I'm still trying to figure it out. But what I will tell you is that when I play the original, it doesn't sound like this to me. I like to play tennis. To me, that sounds harsh and greedy. To me... I like to play tennis. Doesn't. Okay, it sounds very, very clear. Part of the reason for that is that the brain is extraordinarily good at filling in missing pieces of data. As a matter of fact, there's a wonderful article written by Atul Gawande in the, in, 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 in the current issue of The New Yorker, where he talks about how the brain actually makes up a great deal of the sensory information that it gets. So the brain can actually fill in a great deal of missing information. So what I hear today today is something in between the 16 channel and the original. Okay, so let's go on. Let's talk a little bit about cochlear implants and what implications they have for us. Now, cochlear implants are the most widespread neurotechnology in commercial use. There's a number of neurotechnologies out there, but cochlear implants are the best known, and most people agree, the most successful. So right now, there are about 112,000 people in the world who use cochlear implants. Is that a lot? Well, in the United States alone, there are about half a million people who have a degree of hearing loss significant enough to make them candidates for cochlear implants. So I don't know what the figures are for the world, but half a million people in this country alone could use cochlear implants. Worldwide, there are 112,000 cochlear implant users. So as you can see, many people who could potentially benefit from implants don't have them. So is it a big number or a little number? These numbers give you some perspective. Now, let's talk about where, where this kind of technology is taking us. So deafness is the leading informated disability. My body is informated because it crucially depends on data input for its functioning. These implants come off, I can't function out in the hearing world. Now, I should say that one reason that I don't function in the hearing world is because I've never learned sign language. People who have learned sign language can very easily communicate with other people who know sign language. Hearing is not a necessary issue in that particular case. Now, I will say that I'm actually planning to spend a year at Gallaudet this coming year, which is a university for the signing deaf, learning sign language. So I'm about to explore that other world. But I've grown up as a hearing person, so this is the perspective that I come from. Now, the success of cochlear implants has inspired work in other areas to serve other kinds of disabilities. And I'll show you an interesting example. This is a diagram of a retinal implant. Not a cochlear implant, but a retinal implant to help the blind. Now, people go blind for somewhat the same reason that people go deaf. They lose the cells in the back of their eye that convert light into electricity. So similarly, you can amend that by sending electrical signals to the back of the retina. So you can put a little grid of electrodes in the back of the eyeball, and it is fed by a lead of electrodes to a device behind the ear that you know it looks an awful lot like a cochlear implant. And in fact, in the early stages of the, of the technology, it was a cochlear implant. There are some companies that actually used cochlear implants as the neurostimulator to build retinal implants. That's no longer the case, they're not being purpose-built, but the success of cochlear implants has directly inspired work in other disabilities. Now, let's talk a bit more about how the software works, okay, because this is Google, okay, you guys are software. So, let's think a little bit about the structure of the inner ear. The inner ear is laid out a little bit like a piano keyboard in a spiral. As sound waves sweep up the cochlea, they trigger hair cells all the way up the length of the cochlea. The hair cells at the base of the cochlea pick up low frequencies. The hair cells at the apex of the cochlea pick up high frequencies. Basically, the cochlea disassembles sound as it sweeps up through the cochlea. It's a bit like a coin sorter. You pour a whole bunch of coins into a coin sorter, the big coins drop out first, and then the little coins drop out in ascending order. It's a bit how it works in the cochlea. The cochlea pulls out different frequencies. It's almost like the cochlea was built for a cochlear implant. Because you can put a string of 16 or 24 electrodes inside the cochlea, and if you trigger 
this electrode, the user will hear a low frequency sound. You trigger this electrode, the user hears a high frequency sound. So by very artful manipulation of these electrodes, you can give the user a representation of the sound information as it comes through. It's a really remarkable story of how this kind of software was developed. So here's the question. I have 16 electrodes inside my cochlea. Am I stuck with having only 16 channels of auditory information? Well, the answer is in fact no. This is really interesting how this works. It's possible to take two electrodes and steer current in between them to create virtual channels in between the physical electrodes to make the user believe that there are virtual electrodes in between every pair of physical electrodes. So let's zoom in on a pair of physical electrodes. And by varying the amount of current that you're delivering to each electrode, you can make the user think there are seven tiny electrodes in between them. This is an astounding software trick. And this is all by software. So you can give a user better frequency resolution by giving them the illusion that they have more channels in the ear. Now, I actually have the software running in my left processor. And that processor gives me 121 channels. And what it does for me is it enhances my ability to enjoy music. I wrote an article for Wired magazine back in November 2005 called My Bionic Quest for Bolero. Bolero was the famous, some would say infamous piece by Ravel, um, which came out in, in the last century. And it is a piece that I have really loved with hearing aids. When I heard it through 16 channels, it sounded very flat and dull. But when I upgraded to 121 channels, I got my bolero back. I got a lot of the, the plangency and the timbre and the delight of hearing the individual sound that I had not been able to hear before. For me, that was a, a very profound experience. So you can go online and dig out that wired story. As a matter of fact, I'm happy to say that in the current issue of Wired, the one now on the stands, there's a short follow-up on page 56, because Wired is having a retrospective of some of its most famous pieces, and they, they, they were nice enough to choose, to choose mine. So you can see there's a the picture of my skull, and there's a picture of me. And during the photographing session, I was just thinking like, thinking like, I can't be living this life. You know, this is just too cool. And they couldn't really stop me from smiling during the, during the photo shoot. I was like, be serious. I was like, I, I can't be serious. Okay, so now, so far we've talked about the use of these kinds of technologies for disabilities. So now I want to start asking the question, is it possible to use these kinds of technologies to enhance people who do not have a disability? So let's probe that question over the next couple slides and just see where it takes us. Now, there's some really interesting work. Oh, by the way, I want to point out, um, this is a book cover that I really love. This is the 1973 cover to Michael Crichton's first novel, The Terminal Man. And the cover, as you can see, it says, at down at the bottom, watch this man become a homicidal maniac. Now we're super thriller movie. In The Terminal Man, um, in the plot, electrodes were put into an epileptic skull to control epileptic seizures. And what happened was the guy liked it so much that his brain started triggering epileptic seizures in order to get the electrical stimulation, and it drove him bonkers. So he became a homicidal maniac. But these were the kind of Frankenstein fears that were articulated about implanted technologies back in 1973. And you'll notice, I think it's really entertaining, how similar that cover is to my cover, okay? Except the subtitle is, How Becoming Park Computer Made Me More Human as opposed to being a homicidal maniac. Well, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm a homicidal maniac on a, as a hobby sometimes, but, but, not, but not normally. But anyway, but I enjoyed the kind of cultural shift. You know, I consciously wanted to address that science fiction trope of the cyborg as being this figure of sinister evil. Okay, I'm arguably a cyborg. I actually have computers in my head, but I'm not, not, not on most days, a homicidal maniac, I'm, I'm happy to say. Anyway, informing is beginning to be applied to the brain. In my cochlear implant, what's being informated is my inner ear. It's ear surgery, it's not brain surgery. The electrodes go within a millimeter of the brain, but they don't go into my brain. There are now, however, people developing technologies that put electrodes into the motor cortex or to other parts of the brain to pick up the brain's motor activity and send it to a prosthetic limb. So I want to talk a bit about some of that kind of research. 
Um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to change my sequence a little bit. I want to skip ahead to a really, really cool slide, so bear with me a moment. I'm just going to jump ahead. Okay. I want to show you this fascinating video, okay? And I'm aware that there are some video issues here, so this may have to be edited to, to, get the, to get the picture. Now, this is a video that I saw about two weeks ago when I gave a talk at Brown University. And a guy from DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research, Defense D-A-R-P-A, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, something like that, was showing these eye-popping videos of, of veterans, of amputees using prosthetic limbs. And I had seen earlier prosthetic limbs, and they're these clunky affairs where basically all you can do is reach out and grab something and move it from one, one place to another. It doesn't do very much for you. But DARPA has been, been pouring a lot of money into the development of prosthetic limbs for reasons that are all too tragically obvious. So I'm going to play this video for you. Now, what you're going to see, now these limbs are strap-on limbs. They're not physically integrated with the body. They, they sit outside the body. And so when the user moves their muscles, it picks up signals from their skin and translates that into commands to the bionic arm. So they are, in a way, controlling it with their voluntary, with their, with their mind. They are controlling it because the system is reading the nerve impulses coming from their body and deciding how to translate that into the multiple motions needed to control an arm. So watch. When I saw this video, I was just floored. You can see the degree of control they have over the motion of the limb. The real achievement here is not so much the engineering of the limb itself. If you go to me an auto assembly plant, for example, you can see that the robot arms are incredibly fast and incredibly agile. The real achievement here is picking up what the user wants to do, the nerve impulses, and translating that into how the limb behaves. So when you see these little hesitations in how the limb works, that's not because of the mechanical issues of the arm itself. It's because the arm is trying to figure out how to read what the user wants the arm to do. So that's the real magic in what's going on here. The hardware is amazing. The software is even more so because the software has to read what nerves are sending to the, to the limb, to the stump. Say, so, okay, this means the user wants to do this or this or that. That is the real miracle here. So in this particular case with these limbs, the, it is reading uh, from the skin. 
But there's another group at Johns Hopkins that is developing chips that would go inside the stump and actually directly connect the nerves and send that information to a prosthetic limb. So this really is the informating of the human body to drive a prosthetic limb. It's an astounding, astounding technology. Now, DARPA, okay, obviously they, they want to use it to help soldiers who have lost limbs, but they have also articulated the goal of someday making these so good that they'd be usable by people with normal limbs to enhance their limbs, to give them more power or more reach or more control. So they clearly had the goal of going further with this technology than helping people who have tragically lost limbs. So let's go back now and talk about some wilder ideas. As I said, one of the big challenges is not just mechanical, it's, it's an information technology challenge. It's how you, how you read all the different things the brain is doing, how you translate that into something that happens in the outside world. So people are beginning to talk about how would you do that. I showed you before that array which has 100 electrodes. That array, um, this array here, has 100 electrodes. Each electrode reads data from a single neuron. And you can actually get a great deal of control that way. There are people who are um, uh, tetraplegics, who can't move any of their limbs, who with these chips are able to point cursors to specific places on a computer screen to click on things. So you can do a lot with just 100 neurons. Well, people are trying to think about how can you get more information out of the brain? Well, I was lucky enough to be involved in a PBS production about this issue. And so we talked with two people, um, a person named Patrick Ankutil, who's a postdoc at MIT, and Rodolfo Linus, who is a professor of neuroscience at NYU. And they shared with us some of their utopian ideas of how would you get information out of the brain on a massive scale. So I'll play you this video. This is from the PBS special, uh, The 22nd Century, which aired in January of 07. A lot of excitement because for the first time uh, there was a way to access the brain without never touching it. And the brain being such a vital organ, uh, it's quite understandable, you, you want to leave it alone. So the technology is there. Now the question would be, yes, but can you actually put in nanowires exactly at the place you want? The answer is no, you can't. But nanowires are very small. So 500 nanometers 500 nanometer is very small. If you think of it, that's about um, you know, 100 times less uh, uh, than the thickness of your hair. How do you push the electrode to the brain? So what you do is you actually send a certain number of them. You have a bundle, and then the bundle uh, would, would be, the nanowires would be allowed to, to float into the uh, uh, bloodstream until they can go no further. At the moment, we can wire a rat. We can uh, leave the, uh, the electrodes in the spinal cord. We want to know, if we do so, how long do the wires continue to work properly. We're talking about uh, five years worth of very basic research that needs to be done. So it's a pretty audacious idea, as you can see. So how feasible is that? I've talked to some scientists who say, look, that's, that's, that's out of the question. And even me, you know, I'm not a scientist, I'm a science writer. But I can look at it and say, my God, what about blood clotting? How do you guide each lead to where you want it to go? There are other certain fundamental problems of how do you construct a nanowire thin enough to, con to conduct electricity? How do you deal with the insulation problem? So there are all sorts of te technical problems that make this impossible today. But I'll point out that these exact same objections were articulated to our cochlear implants back in the 1970s. Many otolaryngologists and ENTs said, no way could you get electrodes inside the inner ear. No way could you get enough computational power inside the body to drive them. No way could you supply enough power to the system to make it work. And all of these issues were solved one by one. It took 30 years to do it, but those issues were indeed solved. So one suggestion that I want to make is that this kind of technology may go through the same trajectory as cochlear implants do, to become feasible at some point in the future. So there are some other ideas too. Let me present one of them to you. And this just came out on May 1st, 2008. And I discovered this just by accident, actually, just browsing around May 1st, 2008. And this is a patent application um, by a company called um, let me see, it's uh, 
that's the intellectual ventures. In fact, there was a major New Yorker article about them just a month or two ago, written by Malcolm Gladwell. So I dug out this particular patent application, and it is titled Lumen Traveling Biological Interface Device. Now, a lumen is a surface, okay? So I was thinking, okay, lumen traveling biological interface device, what's that? So I started reading the application, and basically it's this. So the idea is to create these tiny little robots that would that have little motors on them that would actually crawl through blood vessels to a given location, and then with sensors actually listen to nerve impulses or do other things, deliver medications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The idea is that Someday you might have tiny little robots crawling through your body to particular locations to collect data, send data, um, produce medications, and so forth. So again, this idea is obviously highly speculative. Okay, again, you have to wonder about, well, what about blood clotting? What if they get stuck? How do you get them out again? There's all sorts of issues here. But I think what's interesting, and I think what's important, is that people are trying to come up with these concepts. The concept has to come first. Because really, in my first book, in Rebuilt, How Becoming Part Computer Made Me More Human, I actually surveyed some of these, these ideas, and I concluded that it was complete nonsense, because nobody had articulated an engineering path that might make these ideas feasible. Now these ideas are starting to come out, and this is what I'm going to be writing about in my next book. The ideas are important. It's important to have a concept, because that creates the desire to make it a reality. So I'll come back to the, to the list of people, to the... Um, to the inventors. It's a pretty distinguished list of names. People like Grant Farron, um, Dan Danny Hillis, the Connection Machine, uh, let's see, Nathan Merval, used to be Microsoft. So there's some really interesting questions. Um, why are they trying to patent a device like this when the technology doesn't yet exist to actually build a prototype of it? So these are questions I'm asking and to which I will hopefully be able to find the answers for my book. So let's talk about questions. Oh, but first of all, let's, let's talk about mind reading. This is a slide that I just, that I just stuck in. So the, the, you know, the idea of reading minds, I mean, that's what this technology is about. It's about reading intentions and doing something with them in the outside world. So here is an experiment uh, that was written up last year where patients were, rather subjects, were put into an, a functional MRI machine. And they were asked to do a certain task. And here is the task. They were shown a slide saying, select. And when they saw that slide, they had to decide whether they were going to add or subtract the two numbers that they would then be shown. They would have to make that decision, I'm going to add, I'm going to subtract, and hold that intention in their mind. Then the second slide showed them two numbers. They then performed the computation that they had chosen. And then in the third slide, they were given four possible answers. And they chose the answer that corresponded with the answer that they came up with. And that told the experimenters which choice that they had made. All of this was purely an internal mental process, a completely private experience. You're lying inside the tube of an MRI scanner. It's, you know, it's claustrophobic, you're enclosed, you're not talking to anybody, you're not doing anything that, that anyone else would see. And you were making the decision in the privacy of your own mind whether to add or to subtract. While you're doing that, the MRI machine is watching your brain's activity. It's watching the activity of, of blood flow in your brain. And it so happens that the decision to add has a distinctively different neural pattern than the decision to subtract. And with the appropriate signal processing, that difference can be located. So it was possible to design an algorithm that was able to predict with 71% accuracy whether the subjects had decided to add or to subtract. So it was a real mind reader. Now let me just address both how limited and how profound that is. It's profound because it really is reading a thought. A thought is the most private thing that exists in human experience. But now that thought, that action of thinking, is becoming accessible with tools. But it's also limited because the algorithms we're only able to identify two particular patterns, and or subtract. If the subject had thought multiply, or I want to go to Disney World, or I want to work at Google, the machine would have no idea what the user was thinking. 
So it is mind reading, although mind reading of a very limited kind. But the suggestion that I'm making is that maybe it become possible to do more ambitious forms of mind reading. So, in, to, so to begin wrapping up here, so in my, in my book, Worldwide Mind, The Coming Integration of Minds and Machines, I'm going to be asking these questions, questions like, can we go beyond if pattern X, then stimulus Y kind of action to read conscious experience in an open-ended way? Right now, all the research is about that if neural pattern X, then user means Y. If pattern X, then user wants to do this. If pattern Z, then user wants to think add. Okay? So it's very one-to-one. -one. It's linear. It's really just pattern recognition. And of course, Google knows all about pattern recognition. The question is, can we go beyond that paradigm to actually detect what a person is thinking, what a person is feeling? I'm skeptical, but I think this is a question whose time has come. It's time to begin exploring this kind of question in a systematic way, figuring out how do we ask such a question. The question itself is so profound that I think it would be a major contribution just to ask it. Second, can the output of such an open-ended reading be input into another brain so that it has a similar experience. That is, if I see red, will you see red? If I see a giraffe, will you, hooked up to me, see a giraffe? I'm deeply skeptical, actually, because there's a lot of research showing that what we think of as sensory input coming from the outside world is actually, to a shockingly high degree, made up by the brain itself. The brain is basically an expectation machine. The brain expects to see stuff. And it filled in what it expects to see. That's why eyewitness testimony is so unreliable. Because often people literally see things that didn't happen because they see what they expected to see. They didn't see what actually happened. So we know, so asking this question requires us to delve into the neuroscience of how the brain perceives. And that's a question I'm going to be delving into in Worldwide Mind. And finally, how would such a technology be used to communicate in new ways? Now, as we all know, email on the web opened up profoundly new kinds of communication. When I was growing up, I would write a letter maybe once or twice a month, okay? And now, of course, we all routinely write far more emails than people wrote letters back 15 or 20 years ago. It's radically changed the way we communicate with each other. The question I wanted to ask is, where could this technology take us? Could it take us to a place where we can experience each other, communicate with each other, know each other in ways that can only dimly be imagined today? So to wrap up in my final slide, I want to connect some of these dots. Let's review the trajectory that we have gone through. We started in this talk with disability. We started with deafness. We started with things that don't work. And we have gone from there to the concept of informating the body. And by the way, I've been paying attention to Google Health. And I think that is a step to informating the body because Google Health is about recording a great deal of information about a person's health and, and making that transferable in various ways. It may be only a short step, historically speaking, to actually get the data from the body itself rather than just from doctor's checkups and use that data in various ways. That, in turn, brought us to talking about new kinds of communication, particularly with mechanical devices. If you can control a prosthetic limb with your thoughts, then it stands to reason you could also control a car, an airplane, a computer. It would be a wonderful breakthrough for many people to be able to type by thinking. I'd be, I would sign up for that immediately. Okay? So I'm, I'm calling that humorously Google operating system. Because, you know, I think Google is developing the operating system of the coming century. And I think that bringing human beings, bringing human bodies, could be an integral part of that work, informing the body, bringing it into the global information economy. Right now, we only reach the global information economy through our fingers, through our eyes, through our mouths. We don't reach it through our bodies in an internal way. I think that may change. And finally, we came to enhancement. And I've been just addressing some issues of, of enhancement. To be able to communicate with people in new ways, could, to control devices in ways which were not possible before. So the point that I'm making here is that disability and accessibility, which seem like sidelines, can actually move to the center and become the core 
of what people think about the core of new innovations. I think it's an extremely important point. Okay, well, with that, I'm going to wrap up with, with just a reminder here, okay? So I played for you the simulation, and you saw how clunky 16 channel sounded compared to the original. I'll play it again. I like to play tennis. The original. I like to play tennis. So you hear, in some ways, how far we still fall short. But you can also hear how far we have come. That's where the field of cochlear implants was in the middle 70s. And it has gone to here. I like to play tennis. And beyond, with 121 channels in about 30 years. I would like to think that in the next 30 years. I like to play tennis. We get here and beyond. So with that, I want to say thank you. And there's my website, so you can go there and find more information about what I'm doing. Thank you all. So we have about eight minutes for, for Q&A, so I'm happy to, to take questions. Is there any technology that lets... Can we, okay, there, thank you, okay. Is there any technology that lets both of your ears coordinate with each other to effectively get more channels? Okay, great question. The question is, is there a technology that allows my ears to communicate together, okay? And as you notice, I have two cochlear implants, I'm bilateral, and I'm recently bilateral. The answer is no. The two implants are completely independent. They do, eat their, they do their things separately. They have no knowledge that the other implant is there. And that's actually a significant issue for the following reason. The electrode array refreshes the electrons about 5,000 times per second. So in other words, there's a frame rate to each electrode array. The frame rates of both implants are not in sync with each other. So I may be getting input on one side at one microsecond, or millisecond rather, and then get the same information a millisecond behind in the other ear. So they're not actually in sync. So my ears are delivering information to the brain in ways which are scattered, so to speak. And there has been talk of getting the two implants to communicate with each other, say with Bluetooth technologies, to keep them in synchronization with each other. That might be especially helpful for directionality because, so let's say somebody speaks to me from here, the sound reaches this ear first, and then a few fractions of a second later, it reaches this ear second. The brain uses that time difference to tell where sound is coming from. But to do so, it has to work with units of time that are smaller than five thousandths of a second. Okay, so I can do some um, some lo localizing. So I can tell to some extent where sound is coming from. But it's been hypothesized that with synchronization, I would have much better ability to localize. So this is certainly in discussion. Yes, good, good question. Thank you. And any other any other questions? I read your article about Bolero, and I decided I will come to hear anything that you have to say. Um, are you continuing with experiments with technology? I, I remember just you're trying out different software and very eager to try the next one. Yeah, am I fooling around with, with my software? Um, just to some extent, okay. My ability to control my software is limited because I can only do it through an audiologist. I can't sit down at a computer myself and start messing with my own code. Um, it would be lovely if I could do that, but there's all sorts of obstacles, like one being the Food and Drug Administration, okay? Because it is putting electrical energy into your head. So, you know, the FDA doesn't really want patients playing around with their own neurotechnology. Um, but I can certainly do it at a remove through audiologists. The other thing is my grasp of C++ is weak, okay? I took C++ in grad school, nearly killed me. So I have enormous appreciation for what programmers do, okay, because I've tried to do it. Um, so, but it's certainly possible in principle for a cochlear implant user to get access to the hardware, get into the code, and start, and start hacking it. It'd be a very marvelous thing if that ever happens. Okay, more, more questions. We have, we, have the four, we have four minutes. Yes. Hi, um, I'm wondering if you have any philosophies on like with the juxtaposition between disabilities and the, um, the 
Yes. The uh, thank, thank disabilities you. and enhancement. Like currently, like what will happen? Like for example, we have a, a disabled uh, racer for the Olympics. He wants to join the actual Olympics instead of like the paraplegic Olympics. And there's some major controversy over that because he's not quite normative in terms of the body, but he has these, you know, en like enhancement for well, like his limb to be able to run on the track, but that the Olympics are not allowing him to compete. And, but it brings you back to mind like another comparison, not the best comparison yeah. because it has yeah, to do with the voice. Talk Mike, you will make it clear. Yeah, thank, oh, thank sorry. you. Oh, um, yeah. sorry. I'm thinking about a different kind of competition with Secretariat, the hoist. With, with, with what, what was Secretariat, that? the hoist, the fastest hoist. Okay, so you sound like you're saying the word Secretariat. 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 Okay, could someone help me out? Hmm? A racer. Oh, a secretariat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank and, you, thank you. Know, he's like the best, the biggest horse ever, but they found out that he actually had a heart anomaly. Like his heart is like two or three times bigger than mm -hmm. the normal horse, which makes him naturally enhanced. But shouldn't he be disqualified because he's not exactly a normal horse? You know, mm -hmm. like th these are some tension that mm -hmm. we need to think about what makes for a fair competition or what makes for a fair judgment mm -hmm. on the physicality of how we're made up. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, do you have, you know, because you're so into, like, you know, interested in seeing progressions made between disability to enhancement or like everything else in between, do you have any guiding philosophies or mm -hmm. thoughts on how to keep things ethical or? interest will represent it, or perhaps you know, having the table turns will blow all our uh, mm -hmm. common, commonality in, 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 out in the window. Indeed I do. Yeah, you're asking a, a, a profound and important question um, you know, about what the word disability means um, yeah. and what, the, what it means that we are creating a range of human bodies. You know, for example, Oscar Pistorius, who I'm sure you're familiar with, is an Olympic sprinter who, um, who has lost both legs below the knees. And with his prosthetic limbs, he's able to run fast enough to qualify for the Olympics. And the, you know, the issue has been raised, does he have an unfair advantage? Because his prosthetic limbs are so springy that they give him more push-off power than a person with normal legs. Mm -hmm. So he can, in, in theory, outrun a person with normal, with normal legs. So the question is, you know, how do we treat these cases? So I think that, first of all, we are on the, on the brink, we're already seeing a broadening of the concept of what it means to have a human body. You know, we're coming from having this very narrow concept of normal here, abnormal here, okay? And that's an old-fashioned concept that is now starting to give way to the idea that there's a range of different kinds of bodies with various strengths and various weaknesses. Um, and this is an issue that I address in, in my book. So this is something to which I've given a good deal of thought. Now, the there are, there's a way in which I push back against that issue because people sometimes jump to the assumption that a technological enhancement like a cochlear implant or like Oscar Pistorius' legs are automatically improvements. And I have to say, in my personal experience, that's not the case. My hearing is adequate. It is by no means normal. It is far from being superhuman. You know, as, as my friend Ann well knows, I struggle to hear things. People call me, I miss what they're saying on the phone, I had some difficulty hearing what you were saying. So, you know, I'm well aware that the, the unmodified normative human body, and I'm using that word in full awareness of, the, of how problematic it is, is an extraordinary piece of engineering, which we are so far from being able to replicate. To give you another example, with Oscar Pistorius, with his prosthetic limbs, he can run faster than a lot of Olympic people. There's a drawback. He can't walk with those limbs because they're so springy that he can run fast, but when he gets to the end of the course, people have to catch him so he doesn't fall down and then put back on his walking limbs. So in a sense, he is superior, he is, but the limbs he has don't yet match the flexibility and the versatility of the legs that most people are born with. So I push back a little bit against the question because I think that we're still a very long way from being able to reproduce that extraordinary qualities of, of, the, of the human body. Now that said, I think that we're getting close to a turning point where we are able to create people or really help people gain supernormative powers for themselves. DARPA is trying to do that. 
And I think there's a good chance that sooner or later they will succeed. And they will really have to be coping with those issues. You know, but, but, you know, but, but in, in, in summary, what I would say is, I would like to see us get to a conception where, there's a, where we think of the human body as not like disabled or normal, to break out of those limiting categories and instead look for what people can do well and help them to do it to the best of their abilities. And some of those people, like Oscar Pistorius, will do extraordinary things. So thank you. Okay, we are out of time. So it's, it's 2 p.m. Yes, Cliff. Hi. Yes. Uh, I had a question uh, whether you're aware of other people who were, uh, who could not hear, were completely deaf. Could you speak up a little bit? I'm having a little difficulty understanding. Uh, are you aware of people who were completely deaf and then chose to get a cochlear implant? And how was their experience different than yours? Okay, I got part of your question. See, are, are you asking me? Are you asking me about the experience of people who get a cochlear implant um, without ever having had normal hearing? Is that yes, what you're asking? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's good. Okay. All right. So let me let me let me rephrase the question kind of from the start. So if I understand you right, what you're asking me is this: people can get cochlear implants at any age. People who get a cochlear implant shortly after birth do much better than people who get a cochlear implant late in life. And the reason for that is that if the brain isn't exposed to sound early on in a child's life, the auditory cortex doesn't develop. That area of the brain gets taken over by the visual cortex. So they have great visual acuity, but they have little area in the brain left over to decode auditory data. So I've known people who have been deaf their whole lives who have never had anything resembling normal hearing. When they get a cochlear implant, they don't perform as well as people who have had close to normal hearing at some point in their lives. Now me, I'm sort of in between. I've never had normal hearing, but with hearing aids, I can hear well enough to be able to get by most of the time. And that's why I hear well enough in the cochlear implant to use the phone all the time. I use the radio all the time. I listen to TV. I, I go to the movies and so forth. If I had never had usable hearing, I wouldn't be able to do that. So really, the important point is that it's the brain that hears. It's not the ear that hears. So with implants, the sooner you get one, the better your performance will be. Now, have I answered the question that, that you asked? Yes, you did. Thanks. Okay, okay, great. All right, All right. Well, well, thank you very much, Michael. It's been a, a pleasure having you here. And um, we'll also have some time after the speech if, if people would like to get their book signed or have any additional questions. Yes, so we'd like on, to hang out and, and talk. Yeah. On behalf of Google, thank you again. Great, thank you.